you that are viewing by way of Facebook and uh, by way of YouTube. We'll be recording this and posting this tonight. We appreciate you viewing. And, uh, but I'd like you to go to Proverbs chapter 16. Proverbs chapter 16. I want to give you something very practical tonight. That's one of the things I love about my Bible. It certainly is a spiritual book, but it's also a very practical book. It was intended to help me make my way in my journey in this dark world. And it is a dark world. And uh, it wants to have an impact. It wants to have an influence. It wants, it's like gravity. It's always pulling us down. And, uh, and so sometimes we have to have the strength wherewithal to resist these things and take some other steps and take some other measures in our own life. Certainly being a Christian is not a spectator sport, meaning that we can't be passive. You know, you, you, uh, you heard that, uh, that joke that they make or illustration about what a church is. You know, they say that a church is a lot like the Super Bowl. You have, uh, you have some 70,000 people who are sitting around doing nothing, who are in bad need of exercise. And what are they doing? They're watching 22 people do everything, and those 22 are in bad need of rest. All right? And so, uh, and so what we have in our, in our land and in our times is that there's a lot of passivity. Passivity. And so, uh, beloved, we can't afford to do that. We can't afford to do that. I mean, you certainly can't be passive about the grass that grows in your yard, can you? I notice there are some yards around here that try that, but eventually it gets the best of them, doesn't it? You can't be passive about termites, can you? You can't just say, well, what an interesting little creature. Wasn't God wonderful when he made those? Man, they must be eating up all the dead trees everywhere. <laughs> no, they're, they're eating up the lumber in your house. And uh, you've got to be on guard against those things. And I would rather know about termites sooner rather than later, wouldn't you? Amen. All right. Well, let's look at some things. Proverbs 16. Have you found your place there? Look with me, please, in verse 32. Verse 32. Notice what it says. He that is slow to anger is better than the mighty. And he that ruleth his spirit than he that taketh a city. I want to speak to you tonight for just a few minutes in the time that I have about ruling your spirit. What does it mean to rule your spirit? Notice what he said. The person that is slow to anger is better than the mighty. When I think about the mighty, I think about physical strength. Now, you know, Samson, Samson was, uh, I suppose, the poster child for physical strength, was he not? Wouldn't you say he was in the Bible, the poster child? He was the strongest man ever known, Samson. But he was the weakest man, one of the weakest men, when it came to ruling his own spirit. Man, he had to take vengeance. He had to do certain things. Boy, he could get angry at the drop of his hat. I mean, he, he, he did not know what it meant to be temperate. And it cost him his life, did it not? He wound up blind. He, what, what's the thing? He, he, he wound up bound, and he was blind, and he was grinding in the devil's house because he lacked temperance. Well, you know, when you talk about ruling your own spirit, that certainly is a personal matter, isn't it? And, uh, and you say, are you going to get personal tonight, Brother Ed? I might. I don't know. But preaching ought to be personal, don't you think? Don't you think it ought to? Uh, you know, because I've been in some places where a lot of folks need a backboard. You know, like in basketball, they got a backboard, amen, because everything seems to be going over their head, and they, they need a backstop up there to catch it. And, uh, and I don't think that about you all. But, uh, but, you know, but how we handle difficulties, how we handle uh, distresses, how we handle sometimes depression or depressing things, how we handle disappointments. Uh, they all kind of tell a little bit about us, you know, and those are not the only things. There's a thousand other things that we face weekly, monthly, and sometimes daily in our lives. And typically when we think about this, because of the context here, it's talking about temper. It's talking about anger, unjustified. 
because not all anger is unjustified. Some anger, sometimes it's right to be angry. So let me put a little balance on there. Was the Lord Jesus angry? Yes, he did. He took a cat of nine tails. He turned those tables over, didn't he? In the, in the temple, he said, you've made my father's house a den of thieves. It's supposed to be a house of prayer. And he had what was what's called righteous indignation. All right? And so typically when we think about this passage, or in particular because it's talking about anger here, that usually we think about ruling our own spirit when it comes to our tempers. Well, that's only a part of it. What about fear? Do you know what fear does to people? Sometimes it paralyzes them. You know, when something, uh, sometimes when something catastrophic happens, they're frozen. Their fear has so captivated them, they don't know what to do. And so they don't respond when they should respond. So, uh, sometimes, sometimes, it's, uh, sometimes it's not just fear, sometimes it's sorrow. Can a person over sorrow? Yes, they can. Do you know that that happened to Aaron? Aaron oversorrowed for some sons. And the Lord finally had to come along to him and said, basically, hey, you need to straighten up. That he was oversorrowing about these things. And it's possible that, uh, that that just gets the best of you over time. And, and sometimes it can be about lust. Sometimes it can be even about unbelief. When unbelief creeps in, it hates to pack up and leave. It likes to stay and spread out and affect other areas. And so, um, so we all sometimes run into these things. But each of those elements, in addition to temper and so forth and appetites, they all need to come underneath the authority of this matter uh, and be equally controlled. It's a part of ruling your spirit, ruling your own spirit. And so before we can deal with any of these kind of outside things, we've got to learn how to deal with ourselves. That's why it's always important, you know, Debbie and I, we call it foot washing. When you get up in the morning, you have a quiet time, you, get, you wash your feet. And I've said sometimes, well, I'm washing my feet back at the camper, uh, you know. We, we just use it between us. Now the secret's out. Now you know, all right. And... Uh, uh, but sometimes we say that, you know, we're going to have that quiet time, or sometimes I have it down here. Most times I do. And, uh, but, but, but the point is, is that you're not really ready to face anybody until you've dealt with yourself. Because then what happens is you're liable to be intemperate and not in control the, w the way the Lord wants you to be. Well, look, at, look in Proverbs 25, look in verse 28. I think I've laid some good groundwork for you here about ruling your own spirit. Notice what this says. Verse 28. He that hath no rule over his own spirit, Proverbs 25, verse 28. He that hath no rule over his own spirit is like a city that is broken down and without walls. What was, what, what was the thing that made Jericho stand out? Wasn't it its high walls? They, they, could, uh, they could hide behind those walls, and they did, as they looked out on the children of Israel, marching around there every day for seven days and so forth. And, uh, but when those walls came down, what did the children of Israel do? Man, they rolled up in there, didn't they? That's exactly what they were supposed to do and what they did. And when a city has no walls, then what is it? It's subject to invasion. Look what's happening in our land. Look what's happening along our border here in Texas. And I'm not just talking about a physical wall. When, we don't, when, we, when America doesn't have the will and the determination to protect its sovereign borders, then we're subject to anything and everything to invade us. The same thing is true in a person's life. When there are no boundaries, when there's none of this temperance, then everything that comes along becomes like a wind, if you will, that would toss us like a ship. Winds and waves, whereas God wants us to be more on a steady track. Y'all are with me. I know that. So, so how, how do we do this? Well, there are three men that I have selected 
from the Word of God that are good examples of some things that they did in their life that we might incorporate in our life. Now, I'm just going to hit these, hit these quickly and uh, do my best to get you out of here uh, on time tonight. But let me, let me show you. Let's start with David. I want you to go to Psalm 131. Turn left in your Bible. Psalm 131. David is a man who exercised some things, who applied some things in his life when trouble came. And as man, as you go through the book of Psalms, did he not have trouble? Yes, he did. He, you know, trouble seemed to frequent him. And, and it happened to him, and he had a remedy for it. I want, you to, I want you to notice something with me here. Look in Psalm 131, a short psalm, just three verses, and let's read it. Notice what, notice what it says. This is one of those song of degrees as they were going up to Jerusalem to worship. And uh, these were sometimes called the song of steps, taking these steps as they went upward in Jerusalem. Notice what it says. He said, Lord, my heart is not haughty, nor mine eyes lofty. Neither do I exercise myself in great matters or in things too high for me. I, I want you to notice the first thing about him is that David humbled himself. He humbled himself. Do you know that is a great quality to have? Humility, and it is a choice, beloved. The Bible talks about us being clothed with humility. That means putting us in the right perspective in relationship to everything else. David said, my heart is not haughty. You know, it's one of those things. You remember the six things does the Lord hate? Yea, seven are abomination. The very first one is a proud look. That's that haughty spirit. Have you ever met somebody? Have you ever met somebody? You don't know, like that? Uh, you know, there's a good illustration about that. Have you heard about the frog and the two ducks? Have you heard about them? You know, these, were, these ducks were used to being up north, like the kind we had in Alaska when I lived up there. And that frog, he noticed something from his lily pond and from the, from the waters up there. Every time the weather changed, man, those ducks would take flight and go. And they would always head south. And, uh, and so finally, he, 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 you know, hopped over there to him and swam a little bit. And he said, man, I can tell, I can feel in the air the temperature is changing. He said, I know it won't be long, but the two of you all are going to be leaving. And he said, I, I want you to take me with you. And he said, I, I, I want to, I, I've heard you all go south where it's warmer. And he said, man, I could be out on my pad and, and I, could, I could just sit out there and bask in the sun and oh, just be so comfortable. And he said, if you would just take me. And they said, well, well how in the world do you suppose that we could, well, we could carry you like that? Man, we, we, we couldn't, uh, I, I couldn't carry you on my back. I mean, you're a big bullfrog. Look at you. And he said, well, I've given it some thought. He said, I thought about this. He said, I really don't have a way to hang on to you while you're doing all that flapping. He said, but I did come up with something. He said, I think the two of you could carry me. And he said, I've got this stick I found over here. And he said, if you'll just put it in between your bills, this two sticks, I'll get on here with my big old mouth, and I'll hold on while you fly south. They said, are you sure? Have you thought this through? Yes, I have. I, I believe you can do it. I believe you can. Well, the weather changed. They agreed. The weather changed. Sure enough, man, they got that stick. They put it in their bills, and man, off they took, and he's holding on in the middle, and man, they get out over Alaska, and they're going down through southeastern and everything. They finally make it through the flyway. People are looking up and saying, what a strange looking sight. Look at that. Those two ducks and that frog right there. So they get down, I think, so probably somewhere over, uh, I want to say maybe somewhere over Missouri on the way down. And, man, they're seeing all them things. And, you know, folks from Missouri, that's the show me state. And, uh, and, and they, they, they saw that and they said, man, look at that. Those two ducks and that frog holding on right there. I said, man, I wonder who thought of that. And the frog said, me. He did not have a spirit of humility. He just couldn't take it any longer. He just had to tell them who did it. Beloved, humility is so important in our walk. It is a part of temperance, not thinking more about yourself 
than you ought to think. That we ought to have the right estimation. And David said, I, I love how he put this, neither do I exercise myself in great matters or in things too high for me. He just kept his nose out of things where he hadn't been invited. And it kept him out of trouble. You know, I talked about prudence. Some of these things would go right in line with the wisdom of prudence. But he didn't have a haughty spirit. Look at verse 2. Notice what he said. Surely I have behaved and quieted myself as a child that is weaned of his mother. My soul is even as a weaned child. When you're weaning children, oh, it hasn't begun yet, Brother Clint. It hasn't begun. You, you, you think that they cry now? You wait. You wait. Am, am I not telling the truth, ladies? Is that not so? When children are being weaned, that means they're going to get off the bottle. And then they got to have those things. And, you know, I think it was a great, I forget which one, somebody it was, one of the kids and somewhere in our family, they, when, the, when they knew that, that the weaning was over, they took the bottle and they took it over to the trash can, they dropped the bottle in the, in the garbage can. And uh, that they knew that it had been successful. And so what was happening? David said, I, I, as a weaned child, I quieted myself. I quieted myself. And what that simply means is that he was growing up. It's what you have to remember sometimes. Listen, you, you and I, you are young once, but it's possible to be immature for a lifetime. Have you known people like that? And you look at him and it's a shame, you know, it, it, you know to see a 70-year-old man that's behaving like a 16-year-old. It's unbecoming, isn't it? It just seems to be confusion. And a weaned child is a child that has learned that uh, to be still and has learned that, I'm, that they're old enough to know that I'm not going to get everything that I want. And they quieted themselves. Have you ever had to do that? Quiet yourself? Now, I, you know, uh, I, I went to a survival school when I was in the Air Force, and uh, one of the things that they put me in, I, we, we had to go through POW camp, and they looked just like uh, Vietnamese. They all had uh, Russian uniforms. They all wore those things. They all looked Vietnamese, and uh, all our guards and everybody in there, and, and, uh, and one of the things they did, they had us with a hood over our heads, and, you know, put your paws on the shoulders of the animal in front of you, and did all these things, and they, and they made me squat down. I couldn't see, and they made me squat down, and I got in this little place, and, you know, I, I was smaller then, and uh, as, a, you know, as a, as, a, as a crew member, I weighed probably about 190 pounds in those days, you know, lean, mean, fighting machine, all that kind of stuff. Anyway, they put me in a box, and they couldn't get it closed, and so they put their foot in my back and pushed and closed the box. You know, some people don't do well in small spaces. So my, my knees are up underneath my chin. My arms are here by my side. And all I have is my thumbs right here. And I got this, this hood over my face. And so I get my thumbs up. And I, I get this over the bridge of my nose. And I'm not a saved man. I'm a lost man. You know what I told myself, Brother Mill? I, I said, this is only a game. I had to remind myself of that because they made it so very realistic. This is only a game. And I think I had to say that to myself a few more times. Amen. I didn't convince myself on that first one. Now that's just willpower there. But the same thing is true when you and I, when we consider that God sees everything about our lives, that he knows what's best. I had to look to myself. And it really wasn't much help. But what the Lord can do for us is give us what we need. David not only David not only humbled himself, but he quieted himself. Have you, have you ever had to do that with somebody? I've had to do that on, 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 on traumatic scenes where somebody is just out of control. And I've had, to, I've had to say, you know, you're going to have to get a grip. I need you to calm down. And I know women don't like to hear that. Calm down. But sometimes, you know what, because they create more of a problem on scene 
And sometimes the person that's injured creates more confusion to quiet themselves. And so sometimes I would give them a job, something to distract them and get their mind off that. It's called a little dissociative analgesia to do that. Yes, ma'am, it just means I get your mind off of the matter onto something else. But David quieted himself. And sometimes, you know, look, I want you to look up sometimes. I, I thought about preaching it, but you need to look up sometimes the places in the Bible. Get you a concordance and look up the little phrase, stand still. You'll be surprised some of the interesting things that will happen when you and I learn to stand still. Didn't the Lord say, be still and know that I am God? That's what we have to do sometimes when things are kind of coming in on us. Sometimes you just got to be still, particularly when it's coming from more than one direction. Sometimes that happens in our lives. Number three, I want you to look in Psalm 119 with me. Look in verse 52. Psalm 119, verse 52. These are the things that David did. Psalm 119, verse 52. David comforted himself. How did he do that? Notice what he says. I remembered thy judgments of old, O Lord, and have comforted myself. Do you know what he took comfort in? That word judgments there, what he's meaning is the Bible in the word of God. Testimonies, statutes, judgments, uh, all these things are, are all references to the word of God. David took comfort from the word of God. I mean, this is where the promises are found. Promises. Some promises belong to Israel. Some, and they don't belong to us as being in the church. You can't take something that belongs to Israel and try to put it on the church. It was never intended to be that way. You know, that's why people want to say, by his stripes we are healed. So there are people out there that profess that, that uh, man, I'm never supposed to have a cold. I'm never supposed to have a physical infirmity. I'm not ever supposed to have that. I mean, you, they would look at Paul who had a problem with his eyes, and I, I suppose they would say today, man, you just need more faith, Paul. But he sought the Lord thrice, and the Lord said, hey, my grace is sufficient for thee. I'm not going to heal you of that. You say, well, then what are the stripes about? I think that has to do with, with, if you will, with our spiritual diseases that we have. By his stripes we are healed. The, the technical word for it is called expiation. If you look it up, it means to, to secure the atonement for every sin. The death of Christ expiated our sins. Propitiation, a Bible word, has to do with the wrath of God. So not only did Jesus take care of the offenses, but he also satisfied the wrath of God, being our propitiation. And so here David took comfort in the word of God. And you need to know about the promises that belong to us, like, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. That's a good place to start right there. Amen. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. I change not. I am the Lord. All right. Uh, these are promises that you and I have. All the promises of God in him are yea and amen. There's no maybes with God. And so, and so some of these things that belong to the church, you and I need to rejoice in them, bask in them, claim them. And you can be comforted by what's in the word of God. Has it not ever happened when you've had some, when, when your peace has been disturbed and you go to the Bible and you get a word from God? Isn't that a blessing when that happens and you experience that in your life? Our enemies, the world, the flesh, and the devil, they want us to focus and fixate on the problem and not on the promise maker. They try to get our attention going in other places. 
David humbled himself. David quieted himself. David comforted himself. David encouraged himself. Look in 1 Samuel 30. I probably that's as far as I'm going to get tonight. Look in 1 Samuel 30 with me. Turn left from the book of Psalms. I have two other men to go, but I'm not going to give that to you. You'll have to come back. 1 Samuel chapter 30. 1 Samuel is right before 2 Samuel. All right? I'll help you. I like being a help. Amen? You're welcome, brother. 1 Samuel 30. We're talking about ruling your own spirit. Could you see where these things, where David humbled himself? Then his pride wouldn't be on the line. He wouldn't be offended so much. You know, I think it's like what Spurgeon said. Don't be upset if other people don't think very much of you. He said, really, you're a lot worse than even what they think. And it's true. It is true. So I think where these things, humbling myself, quieting myself, I mean, I, that, we get reminded, we should be reminded, hey, I'm still on the throne. When I say I'm, the Lord is still on the throne. Nothing, nothing escapes his vision. Nothing escapes his knowledge. David comforted himself, took comfort in those things. The sovereignty of God does not frighten me. It strengthens me as well as it should you. That the Lord ruleth over these things. Does he not? Yes, he does. And then look at this. Fourthly, David encouraged himself. Look in 1 Samuel 30. Look in verse 6. A little bit of the story here. David felt like, man, we need to go over here and get these... Uh, Get these guys, these Philistines, they had gathered together and so forth. And, uh, and so David was at Ziklag and the Amalekites had invaded the south. And you know, man, the Amalekites in Israel, they didn't get along very well. Had a lifelong problem. These guys, they crop up all the time, don't they? They're, they it seems like they do. And, they had, they, and what did they do? They invaded the south. Uh, and Ziklag, look at verse 1, and Ziklag had burned it with fire and had taken the women captives that were therein. They slew not any, either great or small, but carried them away and went on their, on, on their way. So while David is over here dealing with these Philistines, man, here, come, here comes another enemy, the Amalekites. Let's go in here. With, man, the, you know, the cat's away and the mice are going to play. And that's what they did. So they invade them here and they gather all these captives. They take their women. They take all their things. And so look at verse 3. So David and his men came to the city and behold, it was burned with fire. And their wives and their sons, their daughters were taken captives. We have the same thing happening in Israel today. And look at the impact it has on the mothers and fathers and family members and on that nation when barbarians take their loved ones. You know, and these are supposed to be the days of civility, right? I mean, education being the god of part of the gods of this world, education produces civilization, civility. But it didn't. They burned people alive and butchered them and raped and and then now executed six more of these. I mean, these families are in torment. Now here's David and his men. <coughs> They, are, they've already been fighting, you know, and when you're exhausted a little bit, and I'm physically speaking, you know, when you're tired, you don't do too well. Sometimes you get grumpy when you're tired. Look at verse 4. Then David and the people that were with him lifted up their voices and wept until they had no more power to weep. David's two wives were taken. Look at verse 6. And David was greatly distressed for the people spake of stoning him. You got to find somebody to blame, right? 
when things go wrong. It's got to be somebody's fault. That's the pride of man. And now these mighty men, men that love David, men that would have has, that had hazarded their lives, go down there to Bethlehem and get that water out, sneak through the enemy lines, bring back this water for David. Now they want to kill him. Because the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his sons and for his daughters. You know, when God puts a but in, It's usually an indication of grace whenever God butts in. When men butt in, it's usually an indication of unbelief. I'd like to do that, but we've never done it that way before. You know, they got a, gad, they got a bad case of the mites. You know, sheep get mites, right, and them little bugs. Churches get mites of sheep in there. Well, we might do this, we, we, we might do that. We don't know. We just might. And they were grieved. David was grieved. But it says that David encouraged himself in the Lord. In other words, David didn't panic. David didn't come unfrazzled when it looked like mutiny was everywhere he looked. So, so what happened here? Well, look at verse 8. Uh, correction, verse 7. And David. So you see the word and there? It joins verse 7 back to verse 6. So as soon as David, how does David encourage himself? Right here. And David said to Abiathar, the priest, Ahimelech's son, I pray thee, bring me hither the ephod. What is he going to do? David is going to pray. One of the Psalms, David says, what David said, that he said, I, you know, they, they say that they love me and they do these things, but I have given myself to prayer. And that's what David did to encourage himself. When it looked like all hope was gone, what did David do? He got alone. He got apart with God, beloved. And this is where part of you and I ruling our own spirit is going to the source of strength, the source of power. That's, that's why Paul encouraged the saints at Ephesus, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might, not our might. David couldn't do anything for those men in the sense of defending himself against them. He couldn't do that, but he had confidence that the God of heaven could help him. And you must never lose that, beloved. As long as God is alive, there is hope. And that we can look to him. David believed that. David had faith to pray. David had faith in the power of God. Why? You think about it. Had David already been through Goliath? Yes. Had David already been through a lion and a bear? Yes. Had David already been through some escaping Saul and getting through some of these things? Yes. Even though he said death is just one step behind me. God gave him enough just to keep him one step ahead of it. My point is, is that never, never fear to bring your situation or circumstance to God. Never, never lose hope in that, beloved. Don't ever, because man, God can change the circumstances in an instant. In an instant, that can happen. And what was happening here? David was encouraged. He encouraged himself in this. He went to God and he said, what shall I do? Shall I pursue after this troop? Verse 8, shall I overtake them? And he answered him. Isn't that a blessing? And he answered him. He didn't wait two weeks. It wasn't two days. It was right then and there. David didn't even say, would you hear me speedily? He didn't do that. He knew that David was in a fix. And beloved, he's not surprised by the fixes that we find ourselves in. And that we can go to him. And that we should go to him. And not fail in those things. To rule your over your own spirit. 
You've got to walk in humility. Learn how to quiet yourself. Have that conversation with yourself. You're not going to remind God about something that he's already doing, but it's good to remind yourself about some of these things because we're bad about forgetting, especially when we're in trouble or it seems like it's on the horizon. Comfort yourselves. He is the Father of mercy and the God of all comfort. How do I have that? I have that through the scriptures, and I have that through the author of the scriptures. Is he not called the comforter? He is. And so learn from these things. Keep your focus where it needs to be. Not on the problem, but the problem solver, the promise maker. Our shield. I, 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 I thank the Lord in my prayer time. God, I thank you for being my shield and my buckler, my high tower, my refuge, my strength, my redeemer. I just remind myself about those things. He's all that and a whole lot more. When the chips are down. That I don't act impulsively. That I don't have a knee-jerk reaction. Do I always get that right? No. But I want to. So I guess I'm going to have to go through some more things. Faith worketh patience, right? Tribulation, I should say tribulation worketh patience. Yes, it does. It does. So, so the arm of flesh will fail us, beloved. Think about it with me. The, the enemy says there's no help or hope. And that's a lie. Because he's the father of lies. So what do I have to remember? The Lord says be strong. The Lord hath not given us a spirit of fear, but of love and power and of a sound mind. Power and love and a sound mind. Because fear has a way of eroding our faith. That's why even sometimes in, uh, I, I have read about this. I've heard the testimony of others about this. Like when the Marines were on Iwo Jima and Peleliu and some of those other famous names of Obscure islands, Tarawa and Saipan. We know more about Guadalcanal. We've heard that name before. But Peleliu and things like that. And sometimes those men, when they were, they had gotten into a place where they were hiding, maybe preparing an ambush the night before, and some of those men would fall asleep and then just suddenly in the middle of the night, they would start screaming and hollering. And it was uncontrollable. And they were just having a breakdown, a mental breakdown from the pressures of being at war, at death, at the brink of death, at any moment. And they would scream and they couldn't be consoled that sometimes their own men had to take their life. To shut them up. Rather than give away their position. And maybe have hundreds slain. As a result. They don't tell you about those things. But that's a reality. Fear can eat away your faith. Look what happened with the. Remember when the. Spies went over, 12 spies, 10 came back with an evil report, 2 had a good report. They said, we can do this, let's do it now. But the scripture says that those 10 made the hearts of the children of Israel melt with fear. All oh, beloved, learn how to encourage yourself. Get in that prayer closet when you feel overwhelmed. Get in the prayer closet. When you're outmatched, get in the prayer closet. When the outlook is dim, get in there and spend time with him and let God encourage you in that moment. 
that, that passage said, David said, should I pursue? And the Lord said, pursue, and thou shalt recover all. And you know what? They did. They got them all back. David did the right things. Learn how to rule your spirit. There's a couple more men, Lord willing, we'll look at on another time. But men who did some things to help them maintain the control of their spirit. You know, because that's what temperance is. Is it not one of the fruit of the spirit? It just simply means self-control. Amen? Let's pray. Father, I thank you, Lord, today 